Okay, would you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. For whatever reason. Okay, here we go. Oh, all right. So here you see the map in, in case you didn't see it before uh, on the left side of the screen, uh, which shows you where, <clears throat> where the Gothic cathedrals were. And uh, in the course of the talk, as I just said, uh, we'll come to an, uh, something of an explanation as to why the Gothic cathedrals were where they were and not anywhere else until much later when they also started building uh, Gothic cathedrals uh, in other parts of Europe. Now on the next slide. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the, this is a little bit different than what I had, but that's okay. Um, Gothic cathedrals uh, go back. The, 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 the line of descent uh, uh, that reached Gothic cathedrals came from an old type of Roman and, uh, and even Greek building, which was called a basilica and many, uh, many law churches are still called basilicas. This is a basilica from the sixth century. And uh, you see it's a rectangular building. It's, uh, th there's a second story in the middle. And that is, if you think about it, that is really still uh, the standard type of building for churches in the world. Uh, this is, as, as you can see, there's not much that can be more basic than this. Uh, next slide. Uh, here is a floor plan of the Basilica. Uh, a floor plan that you, as you will see, is very similar to the cathedrals. In the middle, we have a nave. Uh, a nave is a word that comes uh, uh, from the word meaning ship, indicates the main uh, oblong uh, uh, element of the uh, uh, of the structure on each side there is a an aisle which is still the way that uh, many large churches are built uh, towards the uh, the uh, the entrance there is the narthex which is like a vestibule which you can still see today at the uh, at Saint Peter's in Rome for example and uh, on the on the top. We have the bema, which is uh, which ba basically became the choir. The next slide uh, shows you a basilica from the sixth century. You're, you can see that it's the same building structure as we saw on the floor plan of the basilica and that fifth century structure. In other words, at this point in the sixth century, nothing has yet changed from the way large building and buildings, and let me say both public buildings and ecclesiastical buildings, if I may make the distinction that way, uh, had this structure and continued to do so. Uh, well, uh, even today, these kinds of buildings are built. Okay, Eric. Ah, now. Uh, forget the stuff on the right. Uh, th this is an earlier version of the uh, uh, of the PowerPoint. But look at the floor, the, the Romanesque floor plans. This is what has happened uh, after some time after the sixth century. We have gaps in our evidence uh, at this point because very few things uh, 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 survived. Uh, at some point, a transept, uh, which is, uh, how do you like that? This doesn't tell you what the transept is. It gives you all the other, uh, uh, all the other things, you know. This, the cross piece, which is an essential element, uh, an, an essential addition uh, to the uh, floor plan of the basilica has been added by the, eighth or ninth century, not yet in the sixth century, but later on, and these are very, very dark times, I should add, uh, the, the, the seventh, eighth, and ninth centuries, chaos in Europe, chaos in Christianity. Uh, in, indeed, Christianity was the one saving grace uh, that continued to exist 
until the uh, practically the 11th century. Uh, the cross piece, the, the transept, is added to the old basilica floor plan. And essentially, we have what is going to be the floor plan of the Gothic cathedrals. Uh, you see, there's a the, the cross shape uh, has been added. Uh, the chapels, the radiating chapels here, uh, which you may have seen if you have seen uh, uh, cathedrals like this, uh, has been added. And that is our basic cathedral floor plan now. When it says it's Romanesque, that refers to a style of architecture that came into being uh, about, uh, as far as we know, about the 10th century. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm just emphasizing that there are some dark centuries there. This is what's known as the Dark Ages. Uh, uh, some dark centuries and, and, and our evidence is by no means continuous. Moving along, Ah, uh, uh, so I'm going to show you a few examples of what uh, great churches built in the Romanesque style were uh, this, this during the 11th and 12th century from 1080 to 1120, the date is there, in case you can't see it. You see it's a glorious church. Uh, you see that... Um, uh, let me see, what can I put back? Do you see that uh, uh, on either side of the closest uh, uh, pier we're looking at, column or pillar, you may call it, those light, uh, uh, light uh, lit up windows where the light is coming in, those are typical Romanesque windows. We'll come across this all along. Uh, the arch over them is round, which is a... Uh, um, uh, a, a, a typical feature of the Romanesque style. And that round arch, you see also, if you look down the middle, you see the round arch uh, uh, through the arcade, the, the arcades that create the aisles. Uh, next slide. Ah, here you see the, here, here you see, uh, I think this is, yeah, this is the same church. Uh, you, you see it from closer up. See all the round arches. The vaults, these are called ribbed vaults because each, uh, uh, well, you, you see the ribs, I hope. <laughs> I, I can't point, unfortunately. Uh, the, 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 the ribs are exact. Thank you. Uh, how do I do that? Can I do that myself, Eric? After we'll get, you'll give me a lesson afterwards. Uh, you see the, the round arches over the vault and you also see the rounded arches along the arcade. Each of the, each of the those are not columns, they, we call them piers. Uh, the, uh, the arcade of piers uh, is also uh, of, it, with, with round, rounded arches. And these are, these are as, I'm, as I keep emphasizing, uh, the main elements, the main uh, identifying features of the Romanesque style. However, what you do see here, what I should point out, is that we are looking at a very sophisticated building here. And we're looking at a, uh, I would say, a rather a splendiferous building, the way it's lit up, uh, it is, it, it, it has the, uh, it, 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 it has the, uh, the impact imp when you walk in there that of being in a great structure, something that's appropriate to a uh, cathedral, which is, if, you, if you, the word cathedral comes from the Greek, Greek word cathedra, which means chair, and the chair that's referred to is the seat, or, or as, we, as it says it, called in English, C, S, E, E, the C of the bishop. That word C actually means seat, but it has become C. Uh, next, please, Eric. Ah, here is, oh, you, oh uh, here you see the name of, uh, uh, of an other Romanist structure, just so you get 
uh, may be a clearer idea because it's lit up a little bit more brightly. As you see, one of the problems of Romanesque structures is that the windows are small and consequently they are dark compared to what is to come. And what is to come is another an other Romanesque, Romanesque plane. Notice uh, when, when, when you see the uh, uh, Gothic structures, if you can remember what a chart looks like in the opening uh, uh, slide, uh, you see that this is, uh, this is an ornamental structure. Let's put it that way. It is not pretty. It is, it is imposing because it's large, uh, but it is not a pretty structure and it is typically Romanesque, uh, 11th century, not 12th century. Okay. Here you see a, a very attractive, in my opinion, uh, and other example of the Romanesque style, still the 11th century. Next, please, Eric. Ah, now, here is our, Maybe we will call him out here. Uh, 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 Sujet of Saint-Denis, uh, Abbot Sujet, uh, was the abbot of the, of the abbey of Saint-Denis Saint outside of Paris, which is the place where all uh, monarchs are buried. It is, it is a place that... Uh, uh, is of great, it was of great importance in the 12th and 13th centuries in the history of France. Uh, when, uh, on the, during the Second Crusade, when the King of France uh, went to the Holy Land, uh, Abbot Sujet was made the regent of the Kingdom of France. He had such uh, standing importance and he had such abilities. Now, uh, Sujet died in uh, 1150. I, uh, could, could you somehow, has some, some talking on God, uh, if it could be, oh, all right, it's just there. Uh, could you, uh, uh, Sujet died in uh, uh, 1151. He is credited with the uh, invention introduction of the Gothic style. Uh, he started, he had a sender. Yeah, um, Bob. Yes. Yeah, Bob, excuse me. You're getting, a, we're, we're getting an echo of your voice. If you sit back a little bit from the computer, that might help. Okay. Let's try this. Hopefully it's no, no. It's not it doesn't, bad. It doesn't seem to have changed. There's also a couple of people that have their speakers unmuted, and that might be creating an echo too. So you could yeah. try to mute them also. Yeah, so could everybody please make sure that your computers are muted? Oh, look at that. You have to push the little mic button that's on the Zoom app. Yeah, yeah. If you, yeah, in the little, yeah, in the, in the upper right, you know, run your mouse over your, your image and, um, and you should see a little mute button at the top. Okay. Um, uh, so this is the of San Denis, uh, the place. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I'll just talk over. Uh, which Sujay uh, 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 in the uh, it was a very, very uh, Saint Denis, like many other. I'm, I'm very sorry. Uh, uh, Saint Denis like many places in France, had been a church, a rock law. All right, there's nothing I can do, right? Okay. Uh, 
that 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 was functioning uh, probably for from the fourth and fifth centuries. It it is one of the oldest okay. was one of the oldest uh, 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 churches in in all of France, and it kept getting remodeled and rebuilt because these structures burdened down frequently. A lot of it was. Uh, uh, the, the roofs, for example, were made of wood, as we saw in, uh, in uh, Notre Dame, uh, I think, uh, three years ago. Uh, and they were, uh, they were uh, uh, repeatedly rebuilt. That, was, that, enters, that factor enters into the appearance and the building of many Gothic cathedrals because uh, for, or, for good or for bad, it's hard to say, uh, you, when one of these great churches burned down, that created an opportunity for a new structure to be built, not just an opportunity, a necessity, I should say, to be built. And if that happened after about the 1140s, that structure in that part of France would have been a Gothic cathedral because for about 150 years or so, that was the... Uh, uh, the dominant style, the prevailing style in that part of France. Um, so this is uh, the, 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 the facade of this building is, as you see, the, the facade, the first Gothic facade that was, that was built and it was in the 1140s. Now, you're going to ask me, what is Gothic about this? First of all, you see that the arches begin to be pointed. They're not quite sure yet what they are doing, but that is the intention and that is the, uh, that is the evolution that is going to occur. Secondly, you see a, a three-tier structure. Uh, you see the three portals above them, uh, well, let's just look at the two on the side. Uh, above them uh, are a, th those windows, which will, which will come to be known as the Triforium when you see it on the elevation of Gothic churches, which will be everywhere. And on top, you have those large windows. I'm still talking about the, uh, just a small rectangular structure uh, in the facade uh, 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 at the top, you see uh, the, a story of, of, of windows, which is known as the clear story. Those usually are no longer in the structure. They are, well, you will see, they are just there to bring in more light. So this is sort of the first, uh, the first, the first Gothic structure that was built. Later on in the 13th century, it will be made into a large, full-size cathedral, but that doesn't really concern us here because it was, there was nothing new about it already at that time. Please, Eric. Eric, would you move, move it? Uh, hmm. Well, oh, okay. I was, I was going to try to think of a joke to tell you, but uh, <laughs> I didn't have to. Um, all right, we are into Gothic land now. Uh, the Cathedral of Chartres, which was built during those years, 1194 to 1220, uh, is considered by many to be the greatest of all the Gothic cathedrals. It's not the most elaborate, uh, but it has all the elements of a, of a mature Gothic cathedral. And also to, to my taste, I would say it has the most grace, the least uh, grand eloquence. It says what it says in, in, in plain architectural language, and it is not cluttered in any way. We'll come back to this because uh, the short already gives us all the different elements of Gothic cathedrals, uh, which we will look at both on the exterior and the interior. 
the next one, please, Eric. Okay, this is the floor plan of, uh, of the cathedral. And as you see, there is perfect symmetry. It's a beauty. Uh, it has pretty much the same elements that we had seen in connection with the Romanesque floor plans, uh, but it is um, from an aesthetic point of view, it is vastly superior. For example, uh, you see that there are uh, side aisle on the lower part of the of the nave, the next to the lower part of the nave, one aisle. When we come to the transept, uh, the aisle doubles so that we now have a double ambulatory. When you go to short, you will see that when you walking into or through the church and you come to the crossing or to the beginning of the transept and that second aisle uh, appears, it's, it's, I can only, it gives you, it gives you a feeling of openness of an other entrance into the church that is remarkable. Uh, when we go frequently, when I was when I was a kid, and I would go to see these cathedrals when I was in my early twenties, uh, I would admire them usually from the exterior, and I was blown away by them. Even though in those days, that was before this was in the sixties, uh, uh, in that though that was before the French started to clean their their uh, ancient monuments. Nowadays. Uh, these structures are sparkling inside and outside, and they are maintained meticulously and, uh, and continuously. Back in the 1960s, that was not yet the case. Uh, but when you move it, when you go inside the cathedral, which, which I started doing later on, uh, I, my feeling anyway, is, is that the exterior almost pales in comparison with the general feeling you get inside the cathedral. Uh, you see the beauty of proportions. Uh, there is a certain, uh, there's a certain feeling which uh, I, can, <laughs> I, I can only say which, which is a religious feeling that comes over me, and I am not a religious person at all. But the atmosphere of the church, the enclosure you feel about, your, about yourself, and the, the height, which is, a, which is a big part, we will talk about this in a minute, which is a very important element of, uh, of Gothic cathedrals, and the color of the light, because many, many of the windows, especially at Chartres, are stained glass. So the light you get inside the cathedral is, I, uh, sorry for using such a word, is an otherworldly light. You, you feel like you're enveloped, you're enveloped in the building and not just what you see with your eyes, but the general feeling, I, I, I think is, is incomparable. I, I recommend that you take it, <laughs> partake of it, uh, even if you have before. Uh, the, the next uh, uh, slide, please, Eric. Uh, this is just, uh, uh, as it say, as I say, uh, short uh, seen through the wheat fields. You can see short, which is which is in uh, uh, in a uh, uh, in a flat part of France, uh, southwest of Paris, about I think maybe seventy miles or so. Uh, it is in one of the major wheat growing plains of France. So you can see as you're on as you're driving or if you're taking the train, uh, uh, you see the cathedral from a distance. 
and you say, wow, it, there it is. And there's nothing else like it in the world. Uh, Eric, please. Okay, here uh, there, are, there are, I would say there are probably uh, 10 or 12 great Gothic cathedrals of, of, of this age in uh, northwest, northwestern France. And by the way, there are Gothic cathedrals in other parts of Europe also, uh, albeit built a little bit later. Spain has several, Spanish Gothic is very popular in Spain. Uh, there's German Gothic. Uh, you certainly see Gothic cathedrals in England uh, since the connection between uh, uh, France and England in, in these times was, was extremely close. Let's put it this way, uh, the area, Normandy, the area around uh, Northwestern France, where many of these cathedral, cathedrals were built, uh, was bought, what belonged to, was a, was a fiefdom of the kings of England at this time, until the year 1204, when the French kings reconquered Normandy. Uh, so the Gothic style also spread to very, the, the English Gothic, especially in later years, is a little bit different than French Gothic, but it's, it's clear that they are uh, at least kissing cousins. So I'm, I'm going to show you a few of the great uh, recognized uh, Gothic cathedrals in Northern France. Here is Bourges, which is a little bit closer uh, to the center of France. Uh, next, please, Eric. Uh, here is Notre Dame d'Amiens, which is a, up in Picardy, uh, which is not that different at first glance from Notre Dame de Paris. Uh, next one. Uh, here, talking about very much like uh, uh, Notre Dame in Paris, here you have another one. This is Rennes is the church where the kings of France were crowned. It is to Rennes that uh, Joan of Arc led her troops or led the king's troops in order uh, to enable the king of France to be crowned in Rennes and become a true king of France. This is, you see the, the years when it was built. Uh, here you see a basic similarity uh, of, of the exterior. Let me just say a few words about the facade. Most of these structures have three portals and the portals are decorated, roughly speaking, in the same way. Then there is a second section, uh, which is sometimes called the Triforium, in the middle of which there's a great rose window, as there is, you know, probably in Paris, and as there is also in Chartres. Uh, and then, of course, you have two towers, which, uh, uh, which vary. Uh, short is uh, more uh, whimsical, let's say, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the structure of the towers. One of them, the, the, one, uh, to the, um, the one to the left, which is the southern. Uh, uh, the southern tower uh, is from the, I'm talking about short is from the 16th century. Uh, the, the simple spire-like one is from the 12th century, and it's a beauty. Uh, uh, next one, please, uh, Eric. Ah, uh, here we, we, uh, we start looking at what goes into the building of a cathedral. What are the a Gothic cathedral? What are the elements that make it up and in this case, you, we also see how those elements uh, developed. Uh, three, th this is, I, the title I put on this is Evolution of the Gothic Facade. Uh, and I have to apologize because I just copied it as I found it uh, on the internet. It's labeled wrong. These are not facades. Uh, each one of these is a bay of the nave. If you imagine you're walking down the nave and there's an arcade, uh, there's an arcade on each side of you. Each arc enclosure of that arcade is, is what we call a bay. 
and it's a unit of architecture because it repeats a number of times. Uh, certainly in the lower part of the nave, uh, it repeats probably six times, sometimes eight. Then comes the transept, and above that is the portion of the cathedral that's called the choir. Uh, so here you see how the style sort of uh, uh, finds its way. We, you see the three uh, nave uh, elements, and you see how they become simplified over time. By, and by the time you get to Shark, there it seems like there's some kind of uh, parsimonious beauty that comes out of it that didn't exist before. This is the general development of the Gothic during the 12th and 13th centuries. In addition to all the ornamentation you see uh, on the exterior, which, we, which is very easy to see as just as you walk around the cathedrals, you see this partly, I would call this simplification by the time we get to Shark, uh, that bay has, has taken on what, if, if, from the point of view of, of Gothic architecture, has taken on its classic form. That is the way that is accepted as the most beautiful, uh, the most practical in terms of what you are trying to achieve when you are a Gothic architect, which is to let as much light into your building as possible, to have as little dead wall, as they say, as possible. The, one of the basic uh, uh, principles of, of Gothic architecture with the, in the cathedrals is to reduce the wall space and increase the window space. Romanesque churches were dark. They had small windows, partly because that's all that could be built. The technology had to be, uh, uh, had to be improved, but then as Gothic comes, uh, arrives, and matures, you see what happens is that it is cleaned up as it's made as into as much glass as possible, as much window and as little wall as possible, and to simplify the to simplify the structure and the appearance. And by the time you get to, when you compare the, uh, these, these three uh, uh, structures, the difference is, is, is to me seems astounding. Uh, you don't quite know what to do with the first two, like it really seems like trial and error. And uh, the, the, the builders at the end came to the conclusion same as uh, Mies van der Rohe, less is more. And they certainly like less. Next slide, please, Eric. Ah, uh, here is, uh, uh, short uh, no longer looks like this. This is the interior of, uh, of the nave. And you see, we, we see uh, sort of three bays. Uh, and you see the three-part elevation going up the uh, aisle, the arcade, we sometimes call it, the triforium, the same words I've been using, and on top, what we call the clear story. Uh, and you here, you also see the stained glass windows. Uh, this, this is fully mature Gothic with the suit of 700 years, 800 years, excuse me. Uh, here is uh, uh, the Church of uh, Lawn, which is uh, not far from Shard, uh, shows you the same situation. Uh, here you see there are four levels to, uh, to the elevation. Uh, this, was, this, this was a church that was built about 50 years before Sharp. Next, Eric, please. Ah, 
uh, we're going to talk a little bit about ceilings, I think is the simple way to put it, uh, because uh, one of the, uh, let, me, let me put it this way, one of the, uh, the, the, one way to describe the development from Romanesque to Gothic is that since uh, Gothic architects wanted to, to build larger cathedrals, they had, to, they had to work out the engineering problems. And one of them was, how can you build something so large and so tall in the Romanesque style? The Romanesque style re required, uh, uh, created too much weight. How can you truss up your walls so that they don't crumble down to the side if you are if you have so much masonry going into them one answer to that of course was the gothic itself the height and all the windows if you take out some of the masonry replace it with wall with with uh, with, gla with glass with windows you are lightening your structure and you're making it making it possible for yourself to build taller and larger because your materials now have changed. And other way to do it is, uh, or, or let's say an ancillary way to do it is to lighten your roof, your ceiling. And you do that by this, the, the, the groin vault is what you see when the, at the crossing of a Romanesque church where the transept and the nave cross. Now, in a Romanesque church, uh, uh, it's the groin vault is what, is what you see in a Romanesque church. It is heavy and it limits the size of the church you can build. Now, when you come to the Gothic uh, ribbed vault, uh, the thinking is this, let's have all the stress distributed in several direction by ribs. And the ribs will then carry the weight, the tension from the roof down to the ground through the columns and piers that go down to create the arcades next to the aisles, next to the nave. Better yet, create these special, the ribs and fill in the space for the rest of the vault with very thin materials because all the weight will be carried by the ribs. This is, this is a fundamental idea of Gothic building. Create ribs or shafts, you'll see them, uh, just create narrow elements which, which become the weight-bearing elements of the structure. Fill in the rest, the paper mache, I'm just kidding, it wasn't paper mache, but it was a relatively weightless uh, material. That way you can build higher and you can build larger. Uh, the next one, please, Eric. Here you see, this is, this is now a more sophisticated uh, arch that, the Gothic architects built, uh, you create as you, you create more rib-like, so to speak, uh, elements, and you concentrate all the weight on them, thereby uh, relieving the structure from the weight of a groin vault where everything would have been masonry. Uh, next, please. Ah, here you just see uh, a couple of examples of what these vaults look like uh, 
in operation, so to speak. Here you see uh, Notre Dame de Paris in, uh, in 2012. I put the data on it because I'm not exactly sure what it looks like today. Uh, but you see how beautiful, how beautiful the, uh, 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 the, 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 rib, the, the rib vaults are. Uh, you also see on the side uh, the arcade uh, that we call the triforium, and also the arcade that you can see on the in the lower left-hand corner, which is uh, which is the aisle of the nave. Uh, you can see that here now the uh, uh, the arches are pointed, um, and and later on, or maybe right now, I don't know. Could you show us the next slide, please, Eric? Ah, you, this is another example of the same thing, just to emphasize my point. Next. Ah, here's another, uh, uh, another uh, significant element of the Gothic style. Uh, an other way to lighten your structure. If you look at a Romanesque uh, cathedral, uh, all the buttresses, namely the large uh, masonry pieces that stand on the exterior are part of the exterior of the nave, the purpose of which is to keep the walls up and in rather than down and out. I just made that up. Uh, Gothic uh, architecture, uh, solves that problem by flying buttresses. In other words, let's give support to the tall structure, not with full masonry buttresses, but with support that comes in a form that is as, uh, let's just say, hollowed out as possible. Because as long as it does the job and reduces the weight and reduces the look of uh, 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 and 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 and, uh, and and gives the structure a lighter look, less makes the structure look less massive. You are then accomplishing your end as a Gothic architect. Uh, the next one, please, Eric. Ah, okay. Um, he, I knew this was coming up someplace. Uh, first, let's look at the, all right, just a, just a very simple, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the drawing on the left. Here you see how the uh, flying buttresses work. The nave, uh, the nave, the nave part of the, the nave goes all the way to the roof of the cathedral. The nave is supported by buttresses that start out on the exterior of the aisles and get support more and more flying, so to speak, from I, I, I was going to say further and further away from the nave walls, but it's not really further and further. It's just further, <laughs> further away from the nave walls. But you see how the how this strange. You look look on the right side now, so you can see again how that buttress works. It support the the window in the uh, at the on the left hand side of the right hand drawing. Uh, the window, it creates the aisle, then which supports the exterior wall of the aisle, that buttress. As you move up, the buttress becomes a more distant element and it is connected to the, to, to the taller, to the wall of the nave by means of flying buttresses. Now, uh, maybe you can, uh, let, let, let me just point out to you again, the various uh, 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 parts of the structure. 
on down at the bottom, you see where the nave is with that squiggly line going to the, uh, uh, going, go, going northeast, so to speak. And next to it, you see the aisle. Then uh, you see the triforium. And above that, you see the clear story. Those are the C three elements of the elevation of the nave. Above it, you have the vaults, the ribbed vaults. Uh, this is the basic structure of a mature uh, Gothic cathedral. Uh, by mature, I mean Chartres and subsequently. That's, that's the simple version, uh, which is by no means simple. It's just, a, it's, it's just a very useful drawing, but you see what a complicated operation it is. Uh, and what a, uh, I, 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 I would say, what a very, very clever uh, series of architectural solutions to enable a, a 12th, 13th century group of architects to build something like this that will stand 800 years later and look good and look like something that's part of, uh, uh, part of humanity's uh, heritage. As, as, as the UN likes to say. Uh, next one, please, Eric. Ah, so uh, one of the, as, as I'm sure you know, one of the, uh, uh, one of the purposes or one of the uh, part of the solution to how to uh, create more windows and reduce the walls and uh, enhance the beauty of the, of the whole structure was to put stained glass into these, uh, into these very large windows. And the stained glass is not only decorative, but much of it is also, uh, uh, let's, let's say didactic, things that are, are, are uh, pictorial and intended to instruct. Uh, the beauty of course of the glazing is, uh, is breathtaking, uh, and uh, don't forget, one of the things it accomplishes is to bring that very, very strange light into the structure. Uh, whoever, whoever came up with that thought, and I can't imagine it was just one person or at one time, uh, must have been some kind of a genius. You know, it's, it's, look at that window, the, the, the North Transept facade of short, uh, because these rose windows, as we call them, uh, appear not only on the facade of, of, the, uh, of the church, the West, the west facade, the, the main facade, but also at the end of each transept. So each of those entrances also uh, uh, reinforces uh, reinforces the entrance of this magical light into, into the structure. Now, Chart happens to be the, uh, uh, the cathedral that has the most stained glass of all of them, uh, which really means uh, the most stained glass that has not only been put there to begin with initially, but also that has survived during all these, uh, during all these years. I don't know if you uh, uh, maybe you saw some documentary or heard some uh, or read something about how uh, how these stained glass windows were hidden from the Nazis from German bombing during World War II, but they were all they all survived. It, it was it's it's like this this was a, a very very important element in the defense in in. In the in French defense of the German attack uh, during World War II to save these things. Uh, all right, Eric, we're almost done. Next. Ah, here is one particular window uh, from Short, which tells the story of the life of Charlemagne. Uh, I I uh, I'm not sure I could tell you what each one of them is. Uh, what what the pictures are, 
Uh, but the, the, the uh, huh, huh. Uh, all right, there's this diamond shaped one and the one to the uh, upper, upper left from it looks to me like uh, Charlemagne is on the, is, uh, is waging the war against, uh, uh, against the Muslims uh, in, at the end of the eighth uh, century, which is what the Song of Roland is about which is a uh, 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 which is a a long a long poem written sometime in the uh, 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 in the twelfth century, telling the story of uh, of Roland the Great uh, or Orla Orlando as he's known sometimes uh, a great uh, Christian knight who in fact loses his life. Uh, in the in a battle on the Spanish border with the uh, uh, with the Muslims, so this is an example of what a, a part of a window looks like as you walk down the uh, down the nave of Shard. Uh, next picture, please. Ah, yes. Okay. Uh, well, we have four minutes. So uh, the golden ratio, first of all, let me say this, as you can see in the bottom line, the golden ratio equals 1.618. And the golden ratio is calculated as you see uh, further up. Uh, you see the line A, B, blue and red. Uh, the ratio of A to B, is the same, namely 1.618. Uh, B would be one and A would be 1.618. Uh, no, 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 uh, sorry. Uh, uh, A is one and AB is 1.618. The ratio between A and B, as it says, is the same as the ratio between AB and A. Can you cogitate that if possible? I wish I could be clearer, but this is, the, it's called the golden ratio. It is something, this is something that the ancient Greeks knew about. Uh, presumably Pythagoras was the person who first figured this out. And uh, there is a belief and it seems like it's a, it's not just a belief, but it is sort of a fact, if I may put it that way, uh, that this ratio, uh, if, if this rate, wherever this ratio is used, you are using the most aesthetic way to express something mathematically, that is. And uh, here is, uh, the golden rectangle, which is the same idea exactly. Uh, A is to B as AB is to A. This was sort of a, uh, a mantra during the Middle Ages. It was believed, it, 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 uh, cathedrals were built trying to use the golden ratio as much as possible. Move on from this, Eric, please. We're, uh, uh, okay, now, can you see what, what, is, what, <laughs> what is happening to Notre Dame here? There are three rectangles imposed on it. Uh, can you see them? The bottom one is red. The one above it is blue. And the third one on top is green. They just they just pencil lines. These are each one is a golden rectangle, meaning that the relationship between the red one, the red is to the blue as A and B is to A. Capish? I'm not sure I'm coming through. Uh, maybe, uh, thank you, Eric. Eric, uh, put me out of my misery. 
1225, oh, I, I should just uh, say a word. One of the things that was happening with the building of these great cathedrals in such a small neighborhood was competition. As each one came along, the architect wanted to do something greater, something better, something more elaborate. And uh, they came a cropper, of course, as, as if, since they, they had too much hubris. Uh, the last of these great cathedrals was first started built, they started building it in 1225 in the town of Beauvais up in, uh, up in the Gothic cathedral uh, land. Uh, and they were going to make it the greatest one, the largest one. Uh, they made it half the largest one because when they were midway through, you see, when they were, they got to the, they started with the, uh, uh, with the choir and the apse uh, on the on the right, and they moved forward, obviously, to the to the transept, and at that point, the whole thing collapsed from its own weight. The remainder is there to teach all of us a lesson. And uh, it was in 1283, it was sort of the, uh, the, the, closing, uh, uh, the closing chords uh, of, the, of the great cathedral building, Gothic cathedral building of the 12th and 13th centuries. Oh. I just, I also put here a floor plan of Beauvais so you can see what was built. The stuff that sort of inked in was built. Uh, the nave, they never got to. What really happened is that they wanted to finish it, but uh, the, the workmen said, no, thank you. You know, <laughs> I'm glad I got away <laughs> at the last collapse. Uh, there's one more, uh, one more uh, slide, uh, which is a, labyrinth, which is on the floor of the nave of Chartres Cathedral. What it says is that, let's remember, this is a church. We're doing something here that is, that's basically ineffable and inscrutable. Uh, I lived for many years in a town called Mameranek in Westchester County, uh, uh, a suburb of New York. And in a local church, there was a, a small replica of this labyrinth, which occasionally I could go down to with my kids and walk to find out what life was to be all about. I can't tell you what we learned. And I thank you for your attention. Stand over here. Oh, here we are. I guess I should. Uh... Yes, okay, I will. I will I'll tell you what I need to. Yes. Well, they all say I'd ask to unmute. You may be able to unmute you mute, unmute yourselves, or can I unmute all of them? No, they're yeah. So anyway, there are. I don't see anything in chat. Something may have happened. Oh, there are a whole bunch of there. Um, it's most the questions are all about the echo we had earlier. Okay. Um, <laughs> whoa, come on. Ah, uh, I seem to, to, what could I do? Sorry. I seem to have clicked on, oh, come on. Did everybody go blank? Nope. Oh, crap. I thought that was really wonderful. And I learned a lot about the, the patterns uh, and just through history, the patterns that developed with the architecture. Um, some stuff I'd seen before, I just never had like a word to describe it. So it was really informative and I really enjoyed it. Oh, come on. Oh, now you're, you're muted, <laughs> I think. No, you're... 
and now I'm unmute, unmuted. Yeah, 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 now, yeah, now, yeah, yeah, now you're unmuted, and I seem and I seem to have done something with the image, uh, but that's okay. What, uh, ah, there we go. Okay, I was trying to undo the chat. Okay, um, any other any other questions? I believe I'm on my yeah. Kim? Yes, I, I put it in the chat. What What is the purpose of the spire at the top of the flying buttresses? Is that purely decorative or does it have a structure? Uh, well, I, yes, I would say it's 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 99% decorative, but the 1% is that it gives more height to the whole thing. And don't forget, spires are normal on top of churches. Although sometimes, like in Juan, the whole thing looks ridiculous. <laughs> you know, after you have those two towers, you put this silly looking uh, thing that just sticks up in the middle of nowhere, but they. Yeah, yeah. yeah Bob, Bob you, you, made a, you made a point about uh, how, how bright and light the insides of these uh, cathedrals are and how this has been enhanced by the cleaning of them with the French have been doing for the last 50 years. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's been argued by some people that the interiors of these churches were were all painted and and actually you showed a beautiful example of it in the rose window from Saint Chapelle in Paris where where all of the stone is painted. Um, but where there's very little stone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's yeah, exactly there is very little stone. So so is were were the insides of these churches really painted or is it not really known? I I would, I, I have never been able to uh, come to an answer to that question. I have seen so many answers going one way or the other. There is no doubt that the Romanesque churches were painted on the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, Le Corbusier uh, wrote a book many years ago called When the Cathedrals Were White. Mm -hmm. And he certainly thought that, that the Gothic cathedrals were not painted. But then I've also read things that say that they were painted and let's paint them again type of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> all I can tell you is that to my taste, it's best if they are not painted. Yes. Yes. Well, well, I can actually remember after they cleaned part of Notre Dame in Paris. Yes. Um, being there on an afternoon where the sun was coming through the stained glass and creating a color mosaic on the on the opposite wall. Yes. Yes. Which was, which was quite spectacular. Yes. Yes. That's and I said, oh, this is the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> Because it, because we with our twenty first century taste think that's the way it should look. Exactly, exactly. The other one is too much, you know. It's too too, too fancied up. Just don't do it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even hey, it, even in our times, some people there are all kinds of ways to feel about whether things are more cluttered with color or or more beautified with color. Yep. Yeah. Okay, Kim, Kim, do you want to just repeat your, uh, just say your question that you just put in chat? Okay. In one of your early slides of saint sernin in Toulouse, you can yes. see that there are bricks as well as stone as part of the piers. Is that yes. a regional feature or does it appear elsewhere in France? Uh, it appears elsewhere too in Romanesque structures. Now, there's a, we do have a person here with us who would be able to tell us uh, if maybe limestone is not very available in southern France, because certainly the, the, the northern cathedrals are all made of, all, all, all are of limestone. But from what I know from Eric, it seems that uh, limestone is just as plentiful in southern France. Yeah, it was it was certain there's limestone all through the Massif Central and there's also there's also lots of limestone in the Pyrenees and in, the, in, the, in, the, in, oh, the, in yes. the foothills of the Pyrenees. Yes. Yeah. You know, I didn't get to say anything about uh, uh, what's called the cult of uh, 
of courts, about the people, uh, including uh, aristocrats, who harness themselves or yoke themselves to courts on which they pulled the large stones that went into the building of the cathedrals. And while they were doing that, they were praying and singing hymns. Because that was uh, that, that, that was a, uh, a donation to the church and it expressed their spirituality. And I, I have found no picture of that, unfortunately. But there are, but there are definitely chronicles that, that, that recount these episodes and more than just one. Okay. Anything else? From uh, well, if there is, you know where to find me. <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And, and thank you. As, as somebody said, was it Janet, that we were, uh, that this is certainly open eyes to other aspects of um, Gothic cathedrals. And I'll just, I'll just finish by saying that I'm glad you showed a picture of Beauvais, because me, that's the the ultimate, if I may use the word chutzpah, uh, in this context. Yes, you may. You could, have, you could have used the Greek version, which <laughs> I had the I had the good taste to use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. It, it really is. It really is, and it is. They got their comeuppance. Yep. Yep. It, it's so I don't know. It's so modern that that whole uh, that whole process that they just. Oh, they they exceeded the bounds that they could that, that they could deal with. It's just great. Yep. Great. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you very much. This was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you. see you soon.